Since childhood, I have been mesmerized by the Ner Tamid, the eternal light present in every synagogue that hangs in front of the ark. When the room is full and bright with music and laughter and prayer and song, it is much harder to see that small light and the difference that it makes. But what a comfort, knowing it's there, even when the sanctuary is empty of people, quiet and dark. In the Torah this week, we find the impetus for this beautiful ritual object. We read about the perpetual fire, the Eish Tamid, on the altar of the temple, that it shall be kept burning and it cannot go out. In the words of our sages, Peter, Paul, and Mary, don't let the light go out. It's lasted for so many years. Ibn Ezra adds, the repetition exists to add that even during the day, the fire must burn. Even when we can't see it, we have to know that it's there. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of traveling to Israel with a delegation from Detroit through our federation. It was an honor to be with this small but mighty group. There were 18 of us connected to the community in different ways who left our families to fly to a war zone because we felt like we had to. We had to put our feet on the ground. We had to wrap our arms around our friends. We had to physically show up after months of showing up emotionally and financially and spiritually every single day, every hour, every minute, the way so many of us in this room tonight have been showing up. And I was really nervous to go. I was worried about my safety as a mother and a wife. I was concerned about having to be catered to and taken care of when there was still so much need among the people whose lives had been completely shattered by October 7th and beyond. How could we ask somebody to feed us? to speak to us, to change our sheets, to drive our bus. And I was really terrified that the country that I love so much that I feel in the core of my body would be unrecognizable to me. So for all of these reasons and more, it took this many months for me to get there, but I had to. I had to witness and listen and hear and see to allow myself to be immersed and overwhelmed, to hold our people's pain and also our resilience in my own two hands. But from the moment we arrived at the El Al gate at JFK, I felt emotionally safer than I had since October 7th. The line was crazy. You can imagine it, it was just full of Jews from all over the world. There were Orthodox families with tons of kids and yeshiva students and young Israelis heading back to reserve duty. There were Americans on solidarity missions like ours. It was packed and nuts, and everybody was radiating that same family reunion energy, love and pride and hope, and above all, gratitude to be part of this miracle that we could, together, get on a plane and go home to Israel. And from the moment we landed at a pretty empty Ben Gurion airport, with pictures of hostages lining the walkways, covered in handwritten notes from their friends and family members, it was clear that things were indeed different. We spent our first day in and around Tel Aviv, visiting Hostage Square, hearing from a father whose two sons are still being held in Gaza, meeting with representatives from the IDF, from the US Embassy, sitting with lone soldiers over a shared meal and hearing their stories. And lone soldiers are young people who have come from other countries in order to serve our people in the army. They have no family in Israel, often come without knowing Hebrew because they felt called to protect us. We spent the next morning with a few incredible nonprofits doing immeasurably good work on the ground. We spent time in a rehab hospital for soldiers grievously injured in the war. And then we headed to our partnership region in the Northern Galilee. And there, we really did wrap our arms around our beloved friends, our Shin Shinim and Shlichim from past years, people you know, our teen mission staff, our Tamarack campers, dozens of them, many of whom have spent the last five months fighting in Gaza fighting for their lives and their families, losing their friends, experiencing trauma that most of us can only imagine. And then on our third day, we traveled south to bear witness to the catastrophic devastation of October 7th. And I cannot express to you what it was like to walk through Kibbutz Be'eri with a guy my own age who had grown up there, who knew all thousand residents, telling us about his friends, his in-laws, his neighbors who'd been taken hostage and tortured and murdered and burned while he hid petrified in his safe room with his wife and three young children. He described the group chats, the community group chats, the mom's group chats, 
He played for us the calls his mother-in-law made to him, begging for help after they were shot, but before they were dragged outside of their house to the mass grave down the street and shot again. He walked us to their home in a beautiful row of houses leading to the pool and told us how on Saturday mornings all the grandparents would sit outside in the sun with tables set with fruit and freshly baked pastries and cakes, ready for the onslaught of the community's kids who would come and join them for breakfast on the way to the pool so their parents could sleep in a little bit longer. How sacred that time was for the whole kibbutz, their Shabbat. And how, had the terrorists arrived an hour or two later on that sunny October morning, they could have gone to the pool and found every child from the kibbutz there. After that, although is there really an after that, for a part of my heart is still there in that kibbutz, we visited the Nova Festival site, and those of you who came to see the documentary here understand what that was like, but being there in real life, I couldn't believe how flat the land was, how really there was nowhere to hide. But I don't want it tonight to focus on the horrors of October 7th. I do want to share that everywhere we went, we heard the same thing. Every person in Israel, no matter where they were in the country at the time, felt that this attack had come for them right to their doorsteps, their safe rooms for their children and their parents. And they continue to feel a profound sense of vulnerability and sadness and brokenness and violation. This feeling that Israelis have had, that we have had for decades of being so militarily strong, of being invulnerable and impenetrable, it's simply collapsed and people have not recovered from this. And yet, life goes on, people go to work, children go to school. Even in places like the college campus we visited where hundreds of refugee families from the north have been living for months, hanging their laundry outside on dorm balconies to dry. Life goes on. Birthdays are celebrated and meals are shared and Israelis are stepping up for each other and taking care of each other in every imaginable way. Despite, or maybe because of this undercurrent of shared and immediate trauma, the country feels unified in this understanding of the power of this moment. And to be there, to walk with Israel, is to be part of the story. The Hiz Kuni, a medieval French rabbi and scholar, teaches us that even when the Israelites were journeying through the wilderness, our Ner Tamid never went out. If you tried walking with a candle, you know how hard it is to travel while holding a flame. One midrash suggested that a metal cover was used to prevent the flame from going out. That really, if you want to maintain that flame, you have to protect it. According to the Talmud, the eternal flame on the altar was used to light the menorah, a symbol of our homeland. One, can light, one light can light up a space, a sanctuary can light a path forward. But one light can also light others and bring more light into this world. I have found myself in the dark far too often these last many months, but there have been these moments of transcendent light. The release of hostages, allies stepping up for us at great personal risk, Jews coming together from all over the world to show up for each other, to connect to who we are and what it means to be part of this ancient and holy people in this complex modern world. And this trip, this trip with no ego attached, it felt like I carried a candle with me, a flame, protected and nurtured all the way from here, from us to there. As Rabbi Jonathan Sachs wrote in 2008, somehow faith outlives every attempt to destroy it. Its symbol is not the fierce fire that burns synagogues and sacred scrolls and murdered lives. It is the fragile flame that we, together with our children and our grandchildren, light in our homes, singing God's story sustained by our hope. And to that end, I am proud to share that Rabbi Loss and I are offering a mission for Temple Israel congregants this May. Join us if you are able. Don't be afraid. We will bear witness, we will listen and learn, and we will be forever changed by this experience. And also, we will put our minds and bodies to good use through acts of service for this place that we love. Each of us will bring a fragile flame with us on behalf of everybody here, a tiny and vibrant Ner Tamid. Because what is the Ner Tamid if not a symbol to remind us that we are a people of light? In the words of Isaiah, we are a light unto the nations, opening eyes deprived of light, rescuing prisoners from confinement from the dungeon of those who sit in the darkness. Go where there is darkness, cries the prophet. 
because one small light can make all the difference. And we at Temple Israel, we know how to make a difference. So together, we will go ablaze with hope and love and resilience for our land and our people. May this be God's will and also ours. Shabbat shalom.